is on the moon, the uh, mare, the uh, beautiful uh, solidified lava seas. And Duncan and I were just talking about the early Apollos, and there they are on the right side. Uh, you'll notice on the about the two o'clock position on the moon, there's one isolated small round blotch. That's the Sea of Crises. Um, oddly enough, all the lunar uh, seas that they used to think were seas are named uh, either for weather phenomena or emotions. Strangely mm-hmm. enough, they're all weather phenomena or emotions. So the one on the right is the Sea of Crises. There's an emotion for you. And to its left, there's a giant double blotch that kind of meet in the middle. It's almost like a the number eight and uh, it's just to the left of that small um, Sea of Crises. The one on the top is the famous Mare Tranquilitatis, the Sea of Tranquility. Duncan knows all this. I'm just telling the <laughs> listeners here. And uh, the one below it is the Sea of uh, Serenity. Serenity, Tranquility, Crises. See, emotions, that's what we're looking at. And the it's Apollo, a- of course, the Apollo 11 was on that upper one, the Sea of Tranquility. It's interesting you should say that, Bob, because... Um uh, the chap who wrote the music for our film In the Shadow of the Moon, Philip Shepard, uh, I asked him, where did you get your sort of inspiration from? And obviously he's, he, he draws on lots of different things, but one of the things he mentioned to me was, well, I, I, I looked at the names of, of the Mare and uh, I just thought they were really emotive and uh, uh, depicted human emotion and I, I drew some inspiration from from those names. Hmm. Um, left side of the moon is more blo- is kind of a less well defined. There's more blotches there, and uh, on the extreme left, the kind of the darkest part we're seeing is Oceanus. You'll see another one of the watery themes in um, uh, Procellarum, if that's how it's pronounced. Never was sure about that one, and, and I don't know what that one means. I wonder if Duncan does. Or um, Procellarum, Oceanus Procellarum. That's the dark blotch on the extreme uh, left. I mean, we know what tranquility and serenity and and crises, what all of those are. In fact, the the blotch on the lower right is uh, Mare Nectaris, the Sea of Nectars. That's kind of pretty. But Procellarum, what's that? I mean, um, did you were you forced to take Latin in, in in school, Duncan? No, unfortunately not. And it's it's a shame, really, because. Funnily enough, for a lot of um, a lot of the things that I've studied when I was at university, of course, the nomenclature comes from Greek and Latin, and and it was interesting because my father did he had to do it. This was you know way back when, and <laughs> so I would say a name to him, a geological name, for example, like pyroclastic, which is basically <laughs> something that's thrown out of a volcano. It's called a pyroclastic. Well. Pyro means fire, and plastic means broken, broken fire. And he could deduce that, you see. And I thought that was really smart. Um, so it, it, it's definitely uh, something that I think would have helped me. But um, you pick it up as you go along, I guess. Oh, well, you pick up some of it. That's right. We were not like those of us in the physical sciences. We were not like the, the medical people who were uh, who, who were forced to into into more Latin than, than we were. Yeah. 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 It's it, it's a shame. I watched Jeopardy and uh, m- most of the Shakespearean plays. Uh, I, I I tell myself, oh, I I should know this better. This is terrible. I'm a writer, you know. <laughs> so. In any case, this is our coverage of the live lunar eclipse. This is uh, SLU, the space camera. And, uh, wow, this has been an amazing event so far. We have Dr. Duncan Kopp from uh, London. I'm Bob Berman here in uh, upstate New York, in the mountains of upstate New York, near Woodstock, which is no longer a hippie capital, by the way, just in case you wonder. Uh, Summer home, more like a summer home capital in the mountains. And uh, it's good to be here. We've uh, talked about uh, Duncan before and uh, some of the amazing things uh, he's done. As, uh, and m- more recently, um, uh, a thing called uh, The Planets, a high-definition odyssey on the planets, which uh, I've not seen, but uh, I really look uh, forward to seeing. And, and um, a bunch of other things, too. It's uh, just fantastic uh, having him. For my part, Bob Berman, I'm just... Uh, 
Well, I shouldn't be too modest, just. That, that sounds falsely modest. I'm the astronomy editor of the old Farmer's Almanac. That's the original Farmer's Almanac, the one with all the yellow on the cover. The uh, And uh, an editor of uh, Astronomy Magazine. Great to be here tonight and be part of this slew and Google process by which we have uh, people situated in uh, various parts of the world, and they're standing there now. I want to thank Matt and Paul, who are out there in the freezing cold night. Hey, well, maybe it's not so freezing in Dubai or Cyprus at this time of year. Maybe I'm giving them more credit than I should. It's not. It's, this is not a January eclipse, but still, they're out there looking at this gorgeous eclipse. We're approaching, approaching, not yet at the mid part of the eclipse, and we can see that the moon has turned a normal color. It could be black. Could have disappeared. Could be beige. There have been eclipses that uh, barely uh, turned any color at all. So there's all um, sorts of gradations of possibilities, but instead we're looking at a uh, a normal looking eclipse. Duncan, what would you like to talk about regarding the moon? Oh well, where to start, really? I mean, <laughs> I mean, the great thing about the moon, well. I always think the great thing about the moon is it's always there. You know, it's always like it's it's almost comforting to sort of watch its phases and and see it wax and wane. And I've always been intrigued by that. It's uh, it's almost it's a great measure of time. It's it's some sort of degree of stability, I think. And I think you were mentioning earlier about uh, previous civilizations, and you, you can understand how they became c- comforted and in in fact based their well, I mean, a, a lot of their lives are around the moon, and it always amazes me at just how skilled a lot of previous societies were in being able to predict lunar eclipses and predict the phase of the moon and uh, use it as a calendar and use it to, to, to indicate uh, various um, aspects of their lives. And in fact, it's permeated through the sort of fabric of society today there are so many terms and uh, uh, parts of our lives that still revolve around this uh, this uh, lunar phase um, but I guess for me I really I really got to know the moon when we we were working within the shadow of the moon and we, we got to meet those people who who I always sort of think it's one of the most elite clubs in the world if if not the most elite club which is the, the surviving astronauts who walked on its surface. That's and, right. Uh, nine. N- nine are surviving, that's right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, they're getting on there now. They're, they're in their 80s, well, they are, aren't they? They are. They are in their 80s. Now, I would have met them when they were a, a little bit uh, younger, sort of uh, late late 70s, but still incredibly sharp, very lucid, wonderful stories to tell. And in interesting, fact, too, as you brought out, mm-hmm. how the moon has changed each of them, how being on the moon has in very different ways. Yes, uh, that, that, was, that was really interesting because I think thinking about it and uh, each one, they're a very eclectic group of people, obviously a very, very intelligent bunch of people and they have a commonality with regards to their training. But each one of them from my experience of the ones that I met and had the opportunity to talk to are very individual. And, um, Alan, you mentioned Alan Bean who flew on Apollo 12 is, is an artist and a painter. Uh, Charlie has a, a deep faith and, um, that's Charlie uh, Deke, right? That's Charlie Duke who flew mm-hmm. on, on, on Apollo 16. Uh, but what I thought was interesting is it seems to me that once you've gone to the moon and you've returned, um, how, how do you top that? And, and it seems to me that traits that they had, I don't want to speak for them, but traits that they had before they went to the moon, i.e. an interest in, in, in faith or art, art or whatever it may be, was magnified by the experience. So coming back, they decided, you know, I mean, perhaps they wanted to spend more time in, and pursue the things that they'd always been interested in. Um, but a very interesting bunch of, of of people with with, if you think about it, a, a really amazing experience. I mean, I it's a bit shameful, but I always used to look at their feet, and I used to think those feet, 
you know, they've left footprints on on the surface of the moon that are going to be there for millions of years because there's very little erosion on the moon. There's no wind. There's no water. So any footprint that you leave on the lunar surface in that uh, very fine powdery soil that you were talking about earlier, Bob, you know, it's going to be there for such a long period of time. And if we ever go back to the moon, and I'm sure we will, it's just a matter of time. Those places will probably become sites of scientific interest and maybe even museums but those those footprints will always be there and it yes. was interesting to meet the people who the very very top of the pyramid those were the people who who actually got to lay those footprints and as you mentioned earlier you know sort of 400,000 people uh, who who worked uh, very very hard for a long period of time to make it happen and uh, as I, although you didn't mention it in the movie in that very fine movie of yours uh, I understand that the astronaut who left a photograph of his uh, kids, of his family on the surface, the others um, regretted not doing that too. Yeah, that was though, that yes. was Charlie, Charlie Duke. Um, in, in fact, we have, I think we have the picture in, in the film, but um, I, I can't quite remember now because I've seen that picture so many times, but a lovely gest gesture. I know he took, um, in his flight plan, there were, uh, 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 notes from his kids as he was um, traveling out to the moon and um, Charlie always says this lovely lovely piece at the beginning of the film which was um, his father was born shortly before the Wright brothers and he could hardly believe that uh, <laughs> Charlie was going to go to the moon but his his son Tom who was five didn't think it was any big deal. And I think that's a, that's a wonderful... Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, shines a very bright light on how quickly technology yeah, pro, 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 propulses, uh, propulses us forward, pushes us forward, yes, propels us forward. Quite so. I wonder how that photograph is going to endure. We're going to have our next guest, by the way, in another uh, 40 or 45 minutes from now, is going to be Dr. Lucy Green, a, also a Brit and also a... Uh, an astronomer, professional astronomer. Uh, her field is the sun, and she's going to talk about how the sun's intense bombardment with its electromagnetic radiation and its particles have changed the surface of the moon that we're looking at. So I would think, Duncan, that it's going to uh, pretty much mess up those photographs uh, before too terribly long. But uh, Yeah, no, I think, I think I, I don't think that photograph last, lasted very long at all. In fact, I think it was a matter of minutes before it had curled because of the, the surface temperature there. So I, 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 I think I'm right in Charlie telling us that it, it, it was there for just a, a fleeting moment. Hmm. But it is interesting, going back to what you were talking about, how different the different astronauts were. Um, Buzz Aldrin made no secret of the fact that uh, he could not live up to the fame and uh, had problems with alcohol. With, he checked himself into a mental hospital. Uh, he, he had a lot of problems after his time on the moon. Neil Armstrong simply became a recluse. Uh, others uh, turned to religion. Edgar Mitchell uh, became uh, arguably the wackiest of them all and got into uh, you know psychic uh, phenomena. Well, and, uh, I, I, I think I think this is the point I'm trying to make. I I I I, I think to us it may look a bit weird and wacky, but I I don't think actually it, it was. I think all of them had these interests before they went to the moon, but the experience uh, I think magnified their interests. And you know, I, I think sometimes they get a bit of a a bit of a raw deal from my perspective because obviously you know going to the moon is going to change your life but it was an area that perhaps they didn't have any training in they they trained just about for every other eventuality but to train to train for that kind of fame was perhaps something that um was overlooked and would naturally be something that's quite difficult to to come to terms with because so. they so. haven't changed but the way we perceive them changed and changed radically and changed overnight and so from their perspective nothing's different but for us you know these men have gone to the moon i mean well I, well except some of them were different remember how uh, was it edgar mitchell who said he had this uh, 
uh, kind epiphany. of realize epiphany. Yeah. That's right. That's how he yes. put it in your film uh, yes. that he saw a oneness in everything and that yes. uh, uh, himself and Earth and everything was one. He said it was uh, yes. an ecstatic experience. But yes. again, he is the one who embarrassed NASA a little bit with those ESP cards on the moon. Remember? Well, I think he always had an interest in, in, in that particular area. And I